Well, let's get into Romans chapter 4. When I began this series last September, I shared this quote from Ray Stedman. And Ray Stedman said that I think it's safe to say that Romans is the most powerful human document that has ever been penned. This is a great book. This is a life-changing book. I have challenged you to try to be doing some memorizing in it. I hope you are. I'm working on memorizing a portion of Romans. Get it in your heart. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you uh, through this good book that Paul wrote. At least this is our best understanding. Paul penned it in the winter of 57, 58. He had never been to Rome, but he was writing a letter to the church in Rome because he, he cared about it. Interestingly, Paul had never been to Rome, so how did we end up with a church in Rome? Well, to understand that, you have to go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the story of the birth of the church, and the Holy Spirit came, and the Holy Spirit fell. And, and you read this really weird almost story where people all start speaking in tongues and they're speaking the languages of the audience. And there were people from Rome in the audience. And they heard the wonderful works of God declared. <laughs> and when they heard everything that Jesus had done in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they went back to Italy, they went back to Rome, and they started a church. So we got a church there, and things went pretty well. But 15 or 17 years after that, in 49 AD, there was a, a decree from the emperor that all Jews had to move out of Rome. No more Jews in Rome. All the Jews left. When the Jews left, a couple named Priscilla and Aquila ended up in the city of Corinth. Paul was there at the time. They made tents together. Paul learned about what was happening in the church at Rome, fell in love with the church at Rome, and out of that passion, he's writing to them now. But 15 years after the emperor decreed that uh, Rome had to be left, 15 years later, uh, a new decree came out and said, uh, you guys can come back now. So the Jews made their way back. But there's a problem now. There's a problem. The Jews haven't been there for 15 years. So the Gentiles have been running the church for 15 years. And the Gentiles weren't naughty, naughty, naughty people, weren't running the church the way the Jews thought the church should be run. The Gentiles had some theological convictions that were a little different than a good Jewish boy would have. And that's the background to Romans chapter 4 as we, uh, we look at it and uh, begin a journey back into this book. So I just want to spend time in Romans chapter 4 this morning kind of re, uh, giving us a new grounding or rebearing. Uh, in in this this book, so Paul is confronted with this situation. This is why he's writing this book. Uh, the 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 Gentiles have been running the church. The Jews are back, and now they're struggling about how to how to relate to each other. There's there's conflict about what is right and what is wrong. There's conflict about what you really needed to be doing to be in right relationship with God. So he's addressing this question, what do you need to do to be right with God? I want everybody here this morning to understand that that's the most important question you deal with in life. What do you need to do to be right with God? You can think about a lot of other things. But the most important question you need to answer is what you need to do to be right with God. 
It's neat if you can figure out how to make more money. But in the end, you can't take the stuff with you. The question that matters the most when it's all said and done is, what do you need to do to be right with God? And the problem here in, in Romans chapter 4 is the Jews and the Gentiles had pretty different perspectives on what you needed to do to get right with God. The Jews, the conviction of the Jews was pretty simple. There were two things you needed to do to, uh, to be right with God. And the first thing you had to do is get circumcised. You're a good Christian. You got circumcised. Good Jewish boys believed if you're following God, you got circumcised. And the second thing they believed that was essential is you had to keep the law. You had to, had to live by the rules. And so the church in Rome was established on kind of a conviction that these things really mattered. And then the Jews left and the Gentiles didn't quite see it that way. And so Paul's trying to deal with it. And Paul argues in this chapter that those two Jewish premises are not true. Uh, and he calls us to an understanding based on the person Jews... Uh, Jews regarded the most highly in their faith. Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. They saw him as the guy who really lived it right. So he goes to Abraham to, to refute uh, their convictions, and he makes some points about how to, uh, to get right with God. And the first one is that... Uh, you uh, need to be, um, you don't need to, do you need to be righteous or you can be righteous before you're circumcised? Abraham was credited as righteous before being circumcised. Romans chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? So Paul's addressing the question here. Uh, how do you get right with God? Is the blessing on people who are only circumcised or can it be on the uncircumcised also? And he goes on to answer the question, picking up in the middle of verse number 9. For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So he makes the point that circumcision isn't the secret to being in right relationship with God. Because Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. So if you're righteous before you're circumcised, obviously it's not circumcision that makes you righteous. That's Paul's first argument. Makes complete sense to me. And his second argument is that Abraham was credited as righteous before the law was given. Abraham lived a few generations before the law was even presented. And God looks down at Abraham and, Abraham and declares Abraham is righteous before he has to keep all the rules because the rules haven't even been made yet. So righteousness doesn't come from keeping all the rules. He's looking at the hero of the Jewish faith. He's looking at, at Abraham. So if righteousness does not come as a result of being circumcised and righteousness does not come as a result of keeping all the rules, how then do you get righteous? And being able to answer this question is the most important question you deal with in your life. How then do you get righteous? Well, Romans chapter 4 is pretty clear on it. Romans chapter 4, verse 3, what does the scripture say? Now, let me stop there. That matters. 
Paul's whole argument here is based on what the Scripture says. You don't, and you've heard me say this a thousand times. Well, that's an exaggeration. Father in heaven, forgive me. But I've said it a lot. You don't decide what you believe by getting on Facebook after supper. You can end up really weird if you do that. Probably depressed, too. You don't find out what you believe by searching the web. If you want to know what you're supposed to believe as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, you get into the Scripture. What does the Scripture say? And this is what the Scripture says about how we end up in right relationship with God. Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as as righteousness. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5. But to the one who does not work, does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. It's, it's It's a faith decision. It's a belief decision. How do you get right with God? His faith is credited as righteousness. Chapter 4 and and verse number 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How do you get right with God? You put your faith in him. Chapter 4 verse 16. For this reason it is by faith. How do you get right with God? It is by faith. Faith, two of the most familiar verses for most Christians are recorded in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace have you been saved. Through faith. How does it happen? It happens through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may, may boast. So what is faith? Let's define it. Let's give you a working definition for faith. Faith is a solid, convinced, unbudging trust that what God has promised, he will do. That's faith. Faith is a solid, convinced, unbudging trust that what God has promised, he will do. So what do you do in, 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 in your relationship with God? How do you get into right relationship with God? You put your absolute trust and confidence in him. You don't rely on anything you can do that you think might be right and might somehow impress him. You put your unbudging trust in mighty God who's paid the price for your sin through the death of his son and his resurrection. That's where your confidence is. That's where your confidence is. It's faith. That's how you get in right relationship with God. Now, what did Abraham's faith look like? I love this verse. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 20. I, I've been thinking about it all week. I started the week in Liberia. I was meditating it in the heat of Li- on, the, on the heat of Liberia. And I, I spent time studying and preparing on the plane back. And, and this verse, out of all the verses in the chapter, I think grabbed my heart. Talking about Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, this is what it says. With respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. What kind of faith did Abraham have? He had this convinced, unbudging faith. He did not waver. Now, some verses, vers- versions use the word stagger. He did not stagger in unbelief. Some people's faith is really a problem for them because they're staggering all the time. They're wobbling. Oh, I feel like Jesus loves me. I'm so saved. I'm in such good, oh, hallelujah, Jesus, I love you. And then they think a bad thought. 
Oh, Lord, I feel really bad here. I hope you don't come back right now because I'd be going straight to hell. And then they have an hour where they thought good thoughts and they're feeling saved again. And they're vacillating between belief and unbelief, between confidence and, and no confidence. Abraham's faith did not waver. Abraham's faith did not vacillate. Abraham's faith did not go back and forth. This is important, friends. James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. We must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Spent about two hours relaxing in Liberia. We'll talk about Liberia more at the end of the service after, we, after communion. But we took two hours on Tuesday afternoon this week to take about a half hour drive to the beach on the Atlantic Ocean. I have never been in such warm ocean water. It was absolutely wonderful. And I have never seen waves like I saw on that beach. And I, I went into the water, and I decided that I would try to fight these waves. And I got down like I was a defensive, an offensive lineman, and I wasn't going to let the defensive lineman through. And every time I did that, it knocked me right to my back. They were coming in with such strength. I was wobbly there. I couldn't get my feet down. And a lot of us in our spiritual walk have wobbly faith. We, we live like we're living in the midst of strong waves that keep coming against us. That is not how we are meant to live. We, we've got Abraham as our example here. This was written for our learning. We need to have this solid, strong conviction, unbudging conviction that what God said he's going to do, he's going to perform. And if he says your sins are forgiven, my friends, your sins are forgiven. It's that simple. What he said he's going to do, he will do. George Mueller's... Uh, a hero of mine, if you've never read George Mueller's story, uh, I'd encourage you to do that. He ran orphanages in, in England in uh, the 19th century. Had about a thousand kids that he took responsibility for feeding every day. He never once uh, sent out a letter requesting money. All George Mueller did was pray. <laughs> His confidence was in God to supply the needs of his orphanage. Stories in his biography of noontime, lunchtime coming along, and there's a thousand kids to feed, and there's absolutely no food in the compound, not, no food anywhere. And George Mueller went out to the thousand kids and said, go to the dining hall. And while they're going into the dining hall, he goes to his knees. And he says, Father, there's a thousand kids who need food. And I know you're going to look after this need. I'm going to go see what you're doing to help. And get up, and there's a wagon pulling on to the compound full of food. And the kids eat <laughs> He's on his way to Canada in 1877. He's decided to travel around the world and brag on what God has done. So he's coming to Canada, Quebec City, from England by ship. He's supposed to be in Quebec City on a Friday. On Thursday, this terrible fog comes over the ocean. And the captain of the ship slows the ship down to a, a bear crawl. It's hardly moving. 
And George Mueller has, a, Mueller has an appointment in Quebec City the next day. So he goes and he finds the captain and says, I have to be in Quebec City tomorrow. You've got to speed this thing up. He says, it's not safe to speed it up. Lies will be a danger. I can't see where I'm going. The only thing that's safe for us to do is to crawl. And George Mueller says, I have to be in Quebec City tomorrow. I'm going down to pray. The captain says, well, I got a weirdo on my hands here. So the captain follows him down, and George Mueller, Mueller at the bottom of the ship falls on his knees and says, God, lift the fog. I've got an appointment tomorrow in Quebec City. And then the captain starts to pray, and George Mueller says, stop, stop praying. Don't need your prayer. God's already answered. Come on up with me. And they went up, and the sky was bright blue. This unwavering confidence in his life that what God said he would do, he would perform. We're all at different places in what we can believe God for, but what I really want to get in our hearts and our spirits today is when it comes to your salvation, you can have absolute faith and absolute confidence that what God said he's going to perform. And if he has said he's going to forgive you, you are forgiven. And you are in right standing with him. So a few quick concluding observations. First one, grace comes with a guarantee. One of our sons was great at giving us guarantees. We'd ask him to do something and we'd look at him, Are you going to do this? He said, guarantee it, guarantee it. After some time, we learned that his guarantees weren't that good. He guaranteed a lot of things. To this day, I'll call him and talk to him and and he'll talk about some game, sports competition, football game or whatever, and, and he'll say, I, I think the Jets are going to win. And I say, you sure? He says, yeah, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Guarantees all kinds of things. Most of the time, his guarantee isn't very good. But grace comes with a guarantee that is sure. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be, everybody say guaranteed. Guaranteed. So that the promise will be guaranteed. Grace kicks in when you put your faith in God and you're not relying on yourself anymore. When you're relying on yourself... Uh, it's not a firm foundation, but when you put your faith in God, his grace kicks in, and I've got really great news for you. Father God above is a good, good father, and he doesn't have bad days. He doesn't have days when he says, I'm not keeping my promises. You made me mad. God's promises are yea and amen. They're for sure. They're guaranteed. Grace comes with a guarantee. Second thing. Faith puts a righteousness credit on your account. So listen to these verses. Romans chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him. Credited is an interesting word. New King James Version and J.B. Phillips' translation takes credited and translates it accounted. Uh, complete Jewish Bible translates it this way, credited to his account. So this is an accounting term. This is an accounting term. And on the credit side of accounting... So, and we all used to balance our checkbooks. I'm not sure how many of us do anymore, but you understand you have money coming out, you have money coming in. On the coming in side, if you put faith in God, on the credit side of your account, God marks it, stamps it, righteous. Credits Christ's righteousness to you. 
So faith puts a righteousness credit on your account. But it gets more exciting than that. Uh, third point. When righteousness gets credited, sin is not taken into account. Listen to this. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. When you put your faith in God on the credit side of the ledger, it becomes righteous. But the debits aren't even there anymore. The debits aren't in the account. They're not taking it. They just go away. The debit side of the ledger becomes completely clear and the credit side gets marked righteous. It's not like Christ's righteousness has become greater than your sin. Your sin doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I think that's exciting. Actually, I think that's very exciting. Matter, I think if we really understood how exciting it was, we'd say hallelujah or clap or shout to Jesus or say hallelujah or something. There is no debit in your account anymore if you put faith in Jesus Christ. God looks at you and everything is on the credit side. You are marked righteous. Well, I'm excited. Because I need that. I need that. The Bible says I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know myself. Credited with righteousness. So, quickly, concluding observation as the worship band comes along. Grace comes with a guarantee. God's grace guarantees the truth we've talked about this morning. Your faith in God puts a righteousness credit on your account. And when righteousness gets credited to your account, sin is not taken into account. Sin no longer exists. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's good news.